Welcome again, everybody. The peril of a wine and cheese reception before an event, of course, is that people will be trickling in, but I think uh, it's time for us to start up. Um, again, if you didn't hear my uh, earlier remarks, I'm Gabriel Rosenfeld, the president here at the center. I'm gonna turn things right over to Marcus Craw, the new executive director of Leo Beck, and he will uh, have some remarks, and then he'll introduce our uh, last promise, the last prefatory uh, speaker of the evening, and then we'll get into our discussion. So, Marcus. Thank you. Thank you, Gav. Um, I'm, I'm very happy to welcome you all on behalf of the Leo Beck Institute New York, which is co-sponsoring this event with the Center for Jewish History. The Leo Beck Institute, which has branches also in London and Jerusalem and an office in Berlin, <clears throat> is dedicated to preserving and promoting the history and culture of German-speaking Jewry. We've been doing this for almost 70 years through our library and archival collections, our family papers, documents, um, objects, works of art. Our documents are digitized and accessible for free to anyone who has an internet connection and has an interest in that. The millions of documents that we have digitized, but all the other programming that we are doing, reflects German history over its many centuries which we think is richly important in its own right, but also very relevant to questions we are facing in the present. And it is with great reluctance that we have to accept that anti-Semitism is one of those questions and one that has become even more pressing over the past years. For that reason, we are happy to co-sponsor this event. Thanks, Garth, and your team for the great collaboration to make this all possible. I also want to thank in absentia Arthur Langermann, uh, who was with us for part of the, the afternoon and who had to leave um, for um, being the driving force behind the exhibit with which this um, event tonight is associated. Um, it is great to partner with so many interesting and relevant institutions and wonderful to see such intellectual firepower assembled on this panel. So I want to thank all of you and I want to thank you all of you for coming and for your interest in this topic, on which we will now hear more from <coughs> excuse me, Dr. Werle van den Dahlen, Deputy General Director and Director of Collection and Research at Kazan Dossin, Memorial Museum and Research Center on Holocaust and Human Rights. Thank you, Werle. So in my turn, it is my pleasure to and honor to welcome you all to this event as the curator of the exhibition Hashtag Fake Images Unmask the Dangers of Stereotypes, which until the 20th of February is on display at the United Nations headquarters here in New York. As mentioned, I'm also the deputy director of Caserne d'Ossin, a memorial, a museum and research center on Holocaust and human rights in Mechelen, Belgium. Caserne d'Ossin is situated on the historical side of the assembly camp where Jews and Roma arrested in Belgium and Northern France were brought to from the summer of 1942 until the summer of 1944. From there, 25,843 Jews and Roma were deported to mostly Auschwitz-Birkenau. You see on this slide the historical barracks which housed the Caserne d'Orsan Memorial on the left, top left, and the museum building on the bottom left. That is uh, situated across from the historical barracks. The vast collection of anti-Semitic images and ob objects on which the historical part of the hashtag fake images exhibition is built upon was brought together by the Belgian Holocaust survivor Arthur Langermann, who is joining us here today. Both his parents were deported from the Dossin barracks. You see their photos on our portrait wall with all deportees from Mechelen on the bottom right. Arthur's father was murdered. His mother survived and returned to be reunited with her son in Belgium, physically and emotionally broken though. On the eve of International Holocaust Remembrance Day, we mark the start of this event by honoring the memory of Arthur's parents and the memory of all Holocaust victims. And we therefore also start this event with the real images, photos of Arthur's parents and of so many innocent victims of the Nazi anti-Semitic ideology. Photos, 
real people whom we will not recognize in any of the images you will be seeing throughout this discussion. And as we will see, because the anti-Semitic propaganda and those images have nothing to do with real Jews, with real life. So thank you for being us tonight, and we hope you have an interesting evening. Thank you. Okay, so um, let me introduce the panelists that are to my left. You've just heard from Verla, of course. Um, to my left uh, is... Dr. Jonathan Brent, Executive Director of the Evo Institute for Jewish Research. Next to him is Jason Guberman, Executive Director of the American Sephardi Federation. Uh, to his left, Dr. Ufa Jensen, Professor of History at the TU Technical University of Berlin and Director of the Arthur Langermann Archive for the Study of Visual Antisemitism. Uh, and Dr. Pamela Nadell, uh, Pat Patrick Clendenin, Chair in Women's and Gender History and Director of the Jewish Studies Program at American University. So why are we here tonight? We're here to unmask anti-Semitism. Well, what does that mean? What does it mean to unmask anti-Semitism? Which begs, of course, another question. What is anti-Semitism? It's worth noting, as many of you, of course, are familiar with, that there's an ongoing scholarly debate about how to define anti-Semitism. There is a debate, for example, about the terms semantic appropriateness, and whether, for example, it might be better to use the term Judeophobia or a term like anti-Judaism. There's also a debate about the temporal appropriateness of anti-Semitism. For example, can we talk about anti-Semitism in antiquity? Can we talk about it in the Middle Ages? This is something scholars have uh, argued about quite a bit. Uh, there's also the question of the imprecision of anti-Semitism and whether it makes sense to use the exact same term to describe social prejudice and the ideas that culminated in the genocide known as the Holocaust. So that's the disclaimer to start off tonight. We are talking about anti-Semitism, but not everyone understands that term to mean the same thing. Um, with that in mind, what does it mean to unmask anti-Semitism? Perhaps we can talk about that verb just for a second. Uh, unmasking is important. Verily, you've spent uh, quite a bit of work putting this marvelous uh, exhibition together dedicated to this task. Uh, but one of the reasons I think we might uh, want to keep in mind is that anti-Semitism often comes in coded forms, in dog whistle terms, like globalists, or East Coast elites, or Hollywood, or George Soros. Unmasking, by the way, is also important to show mechanisms of transmission and mechanisms of dissemination, especially in the form of images. And tonight, um, regrettably, but necessarily, we'll be looking at a lot of anti-Semitic images, both historical and contemporary. Which brings uh, me to one final point or two with regard to uh, introducing how we're going to structure today's uh, discussion. Um, we're going to look at anti-Semitism from a variety of perspectives. We'll look at it, number one, historically. We'll look at it comparatively. We'll also look at it visually. And it's important to note that many of the images uh, that we'll be looking at are in the actual uh, fake images exhibition at the UN. Uh, some of the images are from partner collections here at the Center for Jewish History. Um, and unfortunately, some are downloaded from uh, the internet. Um, in any case, the panel, uh, as it's going to unfold now, will be sort of divided into three sections, each of which roughly will be about 15 minutes. Um, that'll give us 45 minutes to um, raise a whole host of questions, maybe offer some provisional theses, uh, and then we'll open up everything to Q&A. So the first discussion question that we're going to tackle is a sort of broad one. How has anti-Semitism manifested itself visually in the modern era? And how have Jews been depicted in anti-Semitic imagery? And what I hope this first section of our discussion can do is offer some comparative thoughts um, by doing the following. We can locate anti-Semitic imagery in space, that is to say, comparing European instances of anti-Semitism, American instances, and instances from the Sephardic world. We can also, of course, locate anti-Semitism in time by talking about continuities and discontinuities between the 19th century uh, and the present day. We can also, of course, also talk about anti-Semitism by type, because anti-Semitism is not monolithic. You have racial forms of anti-Semitism, economic, political, religious. And the images that we're going to look at um, aren't going to be uh, repetitive. I mean, they'll be repetitive in their hatefulness, but they're not going to be uniform. And so it's important for us to keep these spatial, chronological, and typological examples in mind as we go forward. And if we can succeed in doing this, maybe we can succeed in unmasking anti-Semitism so that we can note change over time, which is, of course, what all historians do. So um, my task now is to be uh, the time clock manager. Um, you can all do the math that three sections of 15 minutes each means with five panelists, three minutes each. So um, forgive 
me, my fellow panelists, and forgive me the audience in advance if one of my fellow panelists is making a very trenchant point and I have to get him or her to move on to the next panelist. But um, we will have time for Q&A and it's all in the interest of making sure there is that availability. So um, let us begin with Ufa. Yes. Good evening. Um, I'm going to say a few words about two images that are from Central Europe and they are from the late 19th century. Um, sorry that you have to look at these images, but I personally think we live in a world where these images, and especially also this one or images like this, are quite present. This is a very famous caricature of Rothschild, um, it was uh, the uh, title page of the humorous magazine The Rear, and we can think about if this was actually humor and in what way this was meant to be humorous. It is an illustration, and it was understood at the time, but it's also an illustration that is still used in some ways of F4 and conspiracy theory, an idea that Jews somehow secretly control the world. You see an older man um, who uh, has his fingers wrapped around the globe. His fingers are actually claws, so uh, in many ways he seems to be like a human bird hybrid, a harpy, uh, and uh, he also has a crown with the golden calf on top of it. And the, as you can see, the title of it on the upper right side identifies the person as Rothschild. As you probably all know, the Rothschild family in the late 19th century was known for um, its international banking, uh, yeah, an international banking family and thus was always attacked uh, as a being in control, in secret control of the financial world and this image I think speaks to, us, to it. So let's move to the second. Um, this one is different. This one is different in character. It's not a. It's not a journal. It comes. It is the postcard. A postcard that was actually sent by a person uh, that I don't. I can't read the name. <laughs> to be honest, that's the only thing I can't read. Uh, um, to a, f a colleague, friend who we don't know, Gustav in Fortsheim. It was sent in the year 1900, and it shows three figures that are both described or shown as Jewish and as pigs. So there is a dehumanizing aspect to this image. This is a, has a long tradition. As you may know, Jews are often portrayed or associated with pigs. It is a confusing image because when you s s read the, the capture on the left in German, we translated it loosely, <laughs> to be honest, it also identifies the uh, pigs as lucky charms. And I, I think this happens quite a lot on these images, that they're actually complex in a way that may have also produced the humorous aspect. So on the one hand, it should bring you luck, but on the, the other hand, it's very derogative and attacking Jews. Um, jokes and humor are a very, very important element in the dissemination of these kinds of images. A lot of images are meant to be funny, and maybe you are reminded of Freud's ideas about the aggressive nature of humor. I think there is a lot to be said for this. So that was my quick part. Thank you so much, Ufa. We're going to transport ourselves to the United States, and Pam, take it away. Um, so first of all, it's, it's amazing to be here, so thank you for including me um, in this conversation. It's great to see so many people here. This is, um, this, this actually dovetails perfectly with what Ufa said because this comes from a humor magazine in the United States called Puck. It was published in 1879, two years before there was a famous um, uh, cause celebre in the United States when the banker Joseph Seligman was not allowed to stay at the Grand Union Hotel 
but he was then copied by um, Austin Corbin when he was building his Manhattan Beach Hotel. And this, this um, cartoon the, um, from Puck Magazine shows how the Jews are sneaking their way into Manhattan Beach Hotel. What's striking about it in terms of unmasking anti-Semitism is that it has both religious imagery in it and racial typing in it. In it. So for example, the, it's a little hard to see, but, but the people who are signing something are signing that they will agree to partake in the food that is being served in Austin Corbin's um, hotel, and the menu is all pig's fair, various forms of bacon and pork. But meanwhile, in terms of the racial typing, we see the people who are racially typed as a, a, a troupe of uh, musicians who are going to be coming in. And we see the kind of classic imagery of large noses, bandy legs. And in the back, some of the images, um, the man, one man is having his hair straightened. And it says that that is by order of um, Austin Corbin, that uh, kinky ca hair must be straightened. And behind him is someone who is having his nose trimmed because Corbin is said um, parabolic noses must be trimmed by order of Corbin down to a Christian style. So next image, please. Um, and this one comes from the Langerman collection. I'm very grateful to Ufa for sharing it with me, for giving me some background. This was a postcard, but it was sent from the United States to um, someone in Germany where he says, here I send you the view of my fellow countrymen. And he's addressing somebody named Richard. And what's striking about this is, first of all, it locates um, anti-Semitic imagery against a lot of other imagery about different um, racial groups in the United States. Um, supposedly, what I think the card is saying, we don't know who the um, artist is, is that they are all supposedly going to um, blend into the Anglo-Saxon race. And of course, what the card is saying, that's not possible. But I would highlight the image of the Jew on your far left, because the Jew is portrayed as swarthy. And at this point in time, Jews are typed as racially different in the United States. And if we went back to the former image, you would see that Corbin actually makes an exception for a white Jew and a white Jewess. Thank you. Darla, if you can take us to Western Europe. Yes, uh, this cartoon um, is a cartoon from Antwerp from uh, uh, 1934, and it, it compares Jews to a plague of locusts, and it's really a, an example of pre-genocidal language and imagery. Um, the organization who made this was far-right, ultra-royalist, ultra and anti-Jewish. And what we see in the image is a clear us-them thinking uh, with the so-called Belgian local population represented by a human woman and two children, nicely dressed and with groomed hairstyles, as opposed to a male plague of locusts who represent Jewish refugees from Germany. So where the local population is represented by a female and two children, the unwanted are represented by male animals. And so there is a clear gender thing going on here, leaving the more vulnerable local population to the aggression of dehumanized or inhuman intruders, represented by an animal which, when arriving in large masses, represents a plague that you want to extinct. The shades of the local population are human shadows. The shades of the refugees are threatening black, is a threatening black area without any possibility to distinguish individuals in them. It is one black swarming over the country. And on the right of the swarm, there are some of the so-called Jews that are somewhat distinguishable as individuals in the group. They are all male. With grotesque, large, often hooked noses, with unkempt haircuts and beards, some with hats and other head coverings, but in all, in, in any case, they are all deformed, ugly to the beauty standards, aesthetic standards of that time and perhaps today, and dehumanized and hovering towards, over, hovering over towards the local population. We use these types of local examples in the permanent exhibition in Caserne del Santo to indicate the first steps in a potential spiral of violence, in a pyramid of hate based on the 10 stages of genocide by Gregory Stan 
it's so important to realize that in those 10 stages, in this image, we are already at step four, dehumanization, after classification, symbolization, and discrimination. It is all the more important to realize how this local example from before the Nazi invasion already brings us well launched onto this ladder of the pyramid of hate. And thus, we should it should make us aware that if we are looking at images and words we choose today, that we have to, that we have to be aware of that and that um, if we talk about waves, plagues, inundated, parasites, our words matter and that uh, ugly features, dehumanized threats, creepy, scary shadows, that our images also matter. We explain as experts in the, of the Holocaust how societies arrived at this unprecedented genocide of the Holocaust and how sharing our historical analysis and expertise can help us today, each in our own local context. And then I would like to take us to a later image, um, this time from the Francophone part of the country by the fascist party Rex. Um, and this uh, harps on a common anti-Semitic theme in uh, a cartoon from 1939. Some refugees established themselves quite quickly, but the vast majority remained poor. And this here is a clear example of economic anti-Semitism, which was widely spread in the Western world at that time. Economic reasons were given by many countries. At the Evian Conference of July 1938, the 31 convening countries decided that they could not loosen their immigration policies vis-a-vis -vis the thousands of mostly Jewish refugees uh, from the Nazi right, from the Third Reich. The international community failed tremendously by deciding that the refugees could not be received by the various countries they were seeking asylum at. And cartoons like this tried to convince the readers that the newcomers would arrive poor, dirty, with filthy hair and beards, badly dressed in rags, that they would be peddlers, but that in no time, however, the cartoon warns, they will work themselves up and become extremely wealthy, but in a very selfish way and becoming like uh, overweight from all the luxury that they give to themselves. So the cartoon depicts the so-called wealthy Jews also with the very ugly treads and the same accentuated, exaggerated nose and ears and almost animal-like fingers. And so it is important to us that we include images like this, this to our local audiences so that um, they give proof that anti-Semitism was there before the Nazi regime came into power and before they took over uh, power in a country like Belgium and other Western European countries. Thank you. The next two images that Jonathan will be discussing are extremely different for reasons you'll now appreciate. Well, this, uh, this first image is uh, one that is very haunting. It's uh, of, a, of a dead child, uh, the consequence of um, uh, a blood libel accusation. And the blood libel accusation in Russia was a very powerful tool of anti-Semites that eventually produced the Bayless trial uh, in 1913. It was the last blood libel trial in Europe. And uh, if we can go to the next, what you see here is a postcard uh, that depicts the judgment that was reached at the end of the trial, which is that uh, Bayless is innocent. And he was declared innocent because a, a Russian peasant, not an intellectual, not uh, an educated middle class Russian, but a Russian peasant voted against conviction. And he said later when he was asked why he did it, he said, because I cannot damn my eternal soul by convicting an innocent man. And yet what this depicts is the abiding uh, uh, power of the blood libel in, in, in Russia that uh, is, is uh, it, it comes back during the Stalin period as well, in which Bayless may be free, but the Jewish people are not. And if we switch now to the non-Western world, 
to make the point that this is hardly a monopoly of Europeans. Jason, if you wouldn't mind leading us through the next couple of images. Right, so the first image here is a work that's uh, part of the ASF's uh, collection found in the David Berg Rare Book Room. Uh, Professor Magda Tedder has uh, observed, to paraphrase her, that Ashkenazim, uh, as in the, the Bayless case and earlier in Simon of Trent, tended to suffer uh, blood libel accusations, whereas Sephardim polemicized them. In this case, in the wrong direction. This is a, a work of a academic anti-Semite, a neophyto uh, convert to Catholicism, who was at the University of Florence and endorsed the blood libel. Uh, this is a work uh, that critiqued Jewish practices and, and inferred, as he put it, that uh, Jews had been uh, expelled from Spain and Portugal because of killing Christian children. The exception to this, uh, this generalization is the Damascus blood libel of 1840, uh, which we, we see here uh, a depiction of the alleged killing of the, the Arab boy who was a servant of Father Tommaso, uh, a priest who had lived in Damascus for 30 years and was uh, going through the Jewish market on February 5th, 1840, uh, and afterward disappeared. The bodies were never found. That work previously uh, uh, says in Arabic, the Talmud. But interestingly, the, the ac accusation didn't get going until the French council, uh, Count uh, Rati Menton, intervened, and the region has never been, uh, never been uh, the same since. Uh, this has picked up steam. There were pogroms against, first starting with the, the Syrian Sephardic community in Damascus and then spreading throughout the region. Uh, in the end, the Jews were pardoned, but, uh, but not acquitted. And that was only after the intervention of a delegation from, uh, of, of Sephardic leaders from France and, of course, the great Moses Montefiore from England. Uh, if we go to the next slide. So when I say it, it has never been the same since, uh, these pictures are from a researcher for the Diarna Geo Museum, a uh, project that I helped found that digitally documents Jewish historical sites in Middle East and North Africa. And the researcher was an American Christian who was visiting prior to the Syrian Civil War and was taken to this church, this monastery, which is still open today in Damascus, uh, and couldn't believe, first of all, to read the inscription that still says that Father Tom uh, Tommaso was murdered by the Jews. And all the more incredulously, uh, he responded when told by his, uh, his Syrian friends that they believed it. And he asked them, have you, have you, are you familiar with the laws of Kashrut? Have you tasted matzah? But nothing he said could convince them otherwise. Thank you. So that wraps up the first of the three sections of our discussion. Um, to recap, we've been looking at the representation, the aesthetic representation of Jews <clears throat> in various anti-Semitic images, and also talking about the different uh, types, economic, political, uh, racial, religious, uh, the different kind of allegations that are leveled against Jews in those categories. Um, what we're going to now move on to is the question of why do these images, <clears throat> as, they or as they are disseminated throughout society, um, why do they get weaponized? And the term weaponization, of course, is intentional uh, because we know from uh, historical experience, especially in the so-called classical era of anti-Semitism, uh, 1870 to 1945, um, that these images serve political purposes. Uh, and whether it's in the years of the crisis of liberalism, uh, in the 1880s and 1890s, or whether it's during the period of inter, uh, interwar ideological uh, extremism um, after World War I and before World War II, we know that uh, these kinds of images serve political roles. And so what we want to do in the next section now is talk a little bit uh, about how, indeed, um, the political context of the images we're about to look at help explain um, their um, virulence. So if we can begin yes. with you. Um, we are jumping quite ahead. You started in 1870, but we are now in the Nazi period already. You can see May 1938 and uh, 1934. It's an edition of the famous um, German newspaper magazine, uh, The Stürmer. Um, and the headline says, a Jewish plot uh, of murder and you see an image um, with uh, two physiognomically marked Jewish people 
and it's also an image of blood libel. You see the blood dripping from the bodies above, so it, it links up with the previous ones. Um, and um, the, the, what, I, what I find interesting, or what is a change to the images that I've argued before, that I've discussed before, before one could say, um, of course, this is also political and ideological, but before these were examples of everyday life anti-Semitism. Postcards show us how permeate this ideology was sent around in the society by people buying these postcards and then sending them. Mm -hmm. Here we have a clearly political context that is a magazine of the Nazi party who wants to argue basically for the, um, for the targeting of Jews at a time when the discrimination of Jews of course takes already place uh, but also the Stürmer is among, is among those groups in the society and especially in the SA, but also in the lower ranks of the party uh, who advocate for a more radical stance. So this is clearly a political weaponization, uh, such images in the Stürmer, and they went on through the entire period of the existence of this magazine. And I think it's also worth noting that to this day, the Stürmer uh, has this reputation of being the, the, the apex of journalistic malpractice so that if somebody makes a comment in the present day media about something that was uh, offensive or ill-advised, you oftentimes say, well, that might as well just appeared in Der Stürmer. So the most notorious of all uh, the Nazi press organs. Uh, Fairla. Yeah, so um, we are in the middle of the Second World War with these um, images, with these posters. What you see here is the Serbian and French version of the same poster by Bruno Hanich. The Serbian language one only showing the poster and the French one displayed in Verviers in Belgium in December 1943, illustrating one of the core mass media at that time to inundate the occupied territories and the, the, the um, Nazi territories with, with the propaganda and the Institute uh, uh, from Ufa with the Langermann collection also has a German version and I'm sure there are other languages also available of this poster. And so what you see here is that these Nazi propagandists were like a politically used um, instrument, uh, professional marketeers, if you wish, to who frequently portrayed virtue as a conspiring financer plotting to take over the world uh, through shadowy manipulation of the allies, Great Britain, the United States, and the USSR. And so we use this image in various languages in the hashtag fake images exhibition to demonstrate how propaganda was used by the Nazi party to spread across Euro Europe under the Nazi regime, and how in certain instances the couleur locale uh, only consisted of the change of language. And again, this poster is also a perfect example of the ways in which a so-called Jew was presented with the dark, shady, ugly features, eye-catching nose, and wearing dark clothes. Clearly a stereotypical image not having anything to do with real Jews. It's clearly propaganda as we empower all visitors in the exhibition to discover themselves, uh, to discover themselves when something is propaganda. This striking image, working on emotions with a clear uh, opponent and, and characteristics combined with an easy to remember slogan um, makes it easy to remember and to recognize the image and the text, especially since it's working on, on our emotions. We, we get afraid when we see this. This is really a classical example. And then it also combines it with conspiracy theory. So the Nazi propaganda ma machine really ensured that they were not only doing the propaganda, but that they also used these mechanisms such as conspiracy theory to spread this message that they wanted to convince the people of by here um, in the words and in the imagery showing that there is a plan that we don't know about, but we're revealing it to you so that you also know this truth, you know, behind these allied forces is the Jew. Um, they say it in words, they show it in the image. So um, this is really conspiracy theory, unveiling the so-called truth and, and unveiling the larger plan that depasses them. So it's, 
it's really typical because it, uh, for this conspiracy to, to theory to have like a powerful group here, the Jews, we, who have a secret plan which is disadvantageous for the majority and, the, and that yields, of course, an advantage for the first powerful group for Jews. And so this is how um, Nazi propaganda was instrumentalized to spread this message of hate and of like um, conspiracy theory throughout all the territories that they administered. And the message, of course, here that only the Jew would be powerful enough to bring communism and capitalism together, you're going to see in the next image, also from the exhibition that Jonathan is now going to discuss before his second myth, his second image. Well, uh, in, the, in the Russian-Soviet world, and this is uh, just at the cusp of it, uh, the Jew could play any role. Of course, we know that today. The Jew is everything because the Jew is at bottom neither a capitalist nor a Bolshevik. The Jew is an opportunist. The Jew is the one who can take advantage of every situation, and that's the great danger that the Jews pose for the world. Uh, and therefore, no matter what guise you see the Jew in, whether the Jew is wearing a red star or he's wearing a banker's hat, he remains at bottom an opportunist. Now, one of the special problems posed uh, by the post-revolutionary period in Russia is that anti-Semitism was made illegal by Lenin. In 1926, Joseph Roth, the great Jewish writer, writing in German, wrote that Russia uh, has uh, declared anti-Semitism illegal. This is the great accomplishment of the Russian Revolution. And once anti-Semitism is solved in Russia, it will be solved throughout the rest of the world. This was 1926. But what that meant was that uh, largely the history of anti-Semitism in Russia in the Soviet period is aniconic because it was illegal. And it appears only in small pockets and then largely using the icons of anti-Semitism that had already been developed in Nazi Germany or in, in, in Western Europe. Stalin, at the end of World War II, has an enemy. The enemy is not the Jews. Let's be clear. It is not the Jews. The enemy, because this is not the way Stalin thought. He thought in global terms, not in local terms. The enemy is the United States of America. And how is he, at the end of World War II, going to organize his society in such a way as to begin a direct confrontation with the United States of America? He is looking constantly, as he does, for mass uh, conspiracies, and eventually he realizes in 1948, which marks the inception of the anti-Jewish, anti-cosmopolitan campaign, with the creation of the state of Israel and the turning of Israel to the United States, that Jews represent the United States of America as indeed, in many cases, Bolshevik leaders had relatives in the United States. Molotov's wife, Polina Zemchuzhina, was Jewish. She was an ardent Stalinist. Her brother was selling gas in a gas station in Bridgeport, Connecticut. And for this, Molotov himself came under suspicion. Well, how do you do this? On the one hand, Stalin made use of the old stereotypes, the blood libel that was promoted and is to this day promoted, it's difficult to believe, by the, the Russian Orthodox Church. But I witnessed this myself in the basement of Beinecke Library at Yale University, where I had an interview with a church father from Boston. And by use of the protocols of the elders of Zion, that is to say what? A global 
Jewish conspiracy to take over the world. And in the middle of the doctor's plot, which begins in 1948, coincidentally, uh, with the murder of uh, Solomon Mahoyles, we see these two levels. Uh, we see two levels of anti-Semitism working together in the Soviet Union. One is the primitive anti-Semitism of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion and the blood libel. And the other that is more abstract and difficult for people to understand is Jews as uh, undermining the Soviet state on behalf of the United States government. So let me just read one confession that was compelled uh, uh, by one of the defendants in the, uh, 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 who were, was arrested, a Jewish worker for the KGB, by the way, in those days, the NKVD, the MGB. In Moscow, there lived more than a million and a half Jews. They have seized the medical post, the legal profession, the union of composers, and the union of writers. I'm not even speaking of the trade networks. Meanwhile, if these Jews, only a handful are useful to the state, all the rest are potential enemies of the state, especially if you consider that in Moscow are to be found all the foreign embassies, foreign correspondents, etc. And so immediately you see the, Jew, the, the, the Jewish conspiracy at work to seize all the levers of government. And then in one of the most remarkable revelations from the KGB archives, we found documents of KGB agents, MGB agents at the time, who were being prepared for a show trial that was going to take place. And fortunately, Stalin dies before this can take place. But this is what they were going to say publicly to the world. This is from a man named Broberman, who was the, uh, the, the uh, associate head of the MGB, a very high position, Jewish man. I referred contemptuously to Russians and in every way praised Jews. This is a confession that is compelled by torture. Elevating their intelligence and abilities, declaring in this regard that really, by their history, Jews were chosen to rule the world. Accordingly, we expressed the view that it was necessary for Jews in the USSR and in other countries to take the example of American Jews who had penetrated into all chinks of the economic and political life of the country, demonstrating influence over the foreign and domestic policies of the American government. And uh, just give me one more second. What is important about this is, and, and it's very important that we understand this as an element of contemporary anti-Semitism. The anti-Semitism is not being directed against you as a Jewish person. It is not being directed as you as a religious, as a representative of a religious group or an ethnic minority. It is not being directed at you even because you don't smell good or you have strange customs. It is being directed at you because in reality, it's being directed against the United States of America. In other words, the Jews become proxies for another target. And this was the means by which Stalin was trying to turn his country against the United States, which had, of course, been allies during World War II. And that's the essence of weaponization, very much so. Um, speaking of the United States, Pam, if you could take us a little bit further back in time. So I'm going to go back to earlier in the 1920s. Um, in US history, this is considered the era that we call the high tide of American anti-Semitism. I think um, we may need to rename it, given the moment we're living in right now. But this is um, Henry Ford's The International Jew. And this dovetails perfectly with what Jonathan was talking about. Because to understand how anti-Semitism becomes politicized, what you have to understand is the role of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. And Henry Ford, the, the automobile magnate, the undeclared candidate for president of the United States, 1923, 1924, um, he never declared himself, but um, everybody else was saying that he should run for president. Henry Ford decides that he needs to find something, an issue, to make his paper, the Dearborn Independent, a popular paper, and to run with it. And he ran with it for 91 weeks. He published the International Jew 
the world's problem. He then had the um, articles, the best articles, which included, by the way, um, copies of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. He then had those um, articles collected into four volumes. They were never copyrighted. They were translated into multiple languages. And he, he made the Dearborn Independent actually into the second largest circulation newspaper in the United States. By the way, in the 20s, when this was going on, American Jews were not buying Ford motor cars. So what happens, and the reason I brought this second image, um, is you can see that Hitler has already heard about Henry Ford's anti-Semitism. It's from March 1923. Hitler's beer hall putsch is not until November 1923. And what he says to this um, Chicago Tribune reporter is that he really admires what Heinrich Ford is trying to do in America, and that if he could, he would actually send some of his shock troops to America to help him. And so what you really need to understand about politicization of anti-Semitism is the role that the Protocols of the Elders of Zion play in that and Henry Ford's role in disseminating it. And to give you one example, um, uh, 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 youth leader, uh, Baldur von Schirach, um, who had read The International Jew in the translation in German, he actually said, well, um, if Henry Ford said this, then naturally we believed him. This was true. And this is uh, before he becomes a member of the Nazi party and a follower of Hitler. And to focus a little bit more again on the east-west relationship and weaponization, Jason, bring us home for the second section of our discussion, please. So as, as we heard about Henry Ford importing uh, the Czechist uh, Russian fabrication of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, uh, much of what uh, I'm focusing on in these images is the Europeanness of Middle Eastern anti-Semitism. It's not a coincidence that the Hamas Charter quotes the protocol. Uh, it's not an accident that, as we see in the picture here at a rally uh, in Lebanon, Hezbollah is using this image of the Jewish spider. That has a history. Uh, there are also images above that of Nazi and Soviet uh, depictions of the Jews as uh, these manipulative weavers of uh, intrigues and, and venomous uh, uh, assaults on, on civilization. Uh, above that is also a picture from 1972, the May Day Parade, showing the, the Zionist spider. Uh, and this isn't an accident. The Hassan al-Banna, the founder of the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, explicitly cultivated a fascist uh, aesthetic in, and uh, mystique in his writing and, and in how he modeled uh, his movement uh, after the fall of Nazism. Uh, not to say there wasn't, as we'll get to later, continuing Nazi influence in the region, but the Soviets took a, a great part in injecting some of this, uh, uh, this conspiracy theories, uh, as we see also in this depiction of uh, a shrine in northern Egypt, uh, which I had a research, I've had several researchers document. It's actually a Moroccan holy site. If anyone's familiar with the Baba Saleh, uh, this is his grandfather, who was buried in northern Egypt. Uh, and after the Camp David Accords, this site became a major pilgrimage uh, for 20,000 or more Jews from around the world, especially Israel. Uh, in the 2000s, uh, a movement spearheaded by the Muslim Brotherhood started to allege that the Jews were going to use this to colonize northern <clears throat> Egypt, this little town which has no Jewish population. Uh, but uh, the, as you can see, the no Abulats era, and there again is the spider. So as we start thinking in concluding terms um, about what this means for the present day, I think the fundamental question is, when we think about contemporary anti-Semitism and when some people go so far as to say there's a new anti-Semitism, um, the question really becomes, is it new or is it just old wine packaged in or poured into new bottles, which raises questions about technolo technological dissemination in a world of the internet. Um, but it was probably, uh, it is a good idea for us to look at some uh, more recent images to see continuities from the 19th century uh, and even uh, in, from earlier times uh, and to see what present-day anti-Semites are doing with them. <clears throat> um, as you can see right here, um, Edouard Dumont, who was one of the main purveyors of French anti-Semitism in the late 19th century, um, is recirculating uh, the image that we began our discussion with this evening that Ufa commented on about Rothschild uh, clutching the globe in his talons. 
Um, and here with this image, you even see, see some simian-like features, again, the Jew being animalistic, uh, but the nose is um, prototypical. And of course, in what unfortunately today is probably the most uh, pernicious and pervasive anti-Semitic meme known as the happy merchant, you see it's uh, doppelganger, uh, basically. And um, before, we, before I call on my panelists to um, sort of make comments about their last images, you can see how uh, multi-purpose, um, all-purpose this image is, whether it's um, condemning the uh, COVID vaccination program of the federal government uh, as somehow a Jewish plot, or whether it's uh, attacking Wolf Blitzer uh, from CNN with the same image. It's unfortunately um, extremely flexible. You'll see umpteen uh, versions of this meme online, and um, it does raise questions, very unfortunate questions, about continuities. So maybe, Pam, if you can bring us to the most recent uh, anti-Semitic controversy in the United States um, from this past fall involving Kanye West. Sure, thank you. Um, you'd have to have lived under a rock or in a cave to have missed what Ye Kanye West said um, in, the, in October and continues to say. And I brought this image for several reasons because it combines multiple themes, multiple tropes of anti-Semitism, and what I think is new is the combination. So the first thing that you see is Kanye is right about the Jews, so that's a reference to all the things that he had been posting or he'd been saying in various television shows, and I'm not going to repeat them. If you don't know it, you can ask me afterwards. But what really jumps out at me is to, are two other things. First of all, what we have is we have the members of the Goyim Defense League, who happen to have their own TV station, which is why it says um, Goyim TV, but they, they're, they're um, showing the Nazi salute. So here is a reference to the kinds of contemporary things that Kanye is saying, but then also we have this reference that's essentially saying Hitler was right. And then what is most stunning is the last, last two lines where it says Rev 3-9 and John 8-44, that's Revelation, and that's the book of John. These are two New Testament texts, which one refers to that the Jew's father is the devil, and the other refers to that the Jews worship in the synagogue of Satan. And what I noticed when I saw this on different websites is that in some websites, that last panel was whited out, so you couldn't see it. And what they're saying, and what this is doing is, and we didn't really go back and talk about Christian anti-Semitism, but the roots of anti-Semitism are deeply embedded in Christianity. And here, this group is bringing those three images together, contemporary anti-Semitism, Christianity, and the Nazis. And it's actually also worth noting on that, on that point exactly that uh, on a lot of uh, far right-wing websites, um, the idea is oftentimes put forth that um, the Jews, for religious reasons, talk disparagingly about the Goyim, and so we, the Goyim, the Christian uh, white nationalist victims, we're going to appropriate that insult, make it part of our own branding, and so the Goyim Defense League, ironically enough, does uh, show some continuities with religious anti-Semitism, as Pam was pointing out. Ufa, if you can take us to uh, a German example. This is a, a contemporary German example, has been used for the first time or the first time actually before the COVID pandemic or the protest against it. I've seen this in other forms uh, uh, with regional imagery or regional text in it. Uh, but really during the first month of the anti-COVID um, pan or the, anti the, the protest against the, the, the <coughs> vaccination uh, efforts, uh, these images became, these kind of stars, yellow stars, became very, very prominent in at these demonstrations, and a lot of people wore them. Uh, it says unvaccinated on it, and that's, it's actually very, it, it's a very simple image, of course, it's the Star of David, but it says a lot of different things. First of all, that this person claims to not be vaccinated, and that apparently there is some kind of a pressure or some kind of a conspiracy of people who want him or her to be vaccinated in order to achieve any kind of sinister goal. Um, that's at least how I understand this. On the, on the other level, and uh, it's a yellow star, which of course uses the Holocaust history of this symbol, and thus the person who shows this image 
uh, basically acquires a victim status, basically says, look, now in our world, we are the victims, we are oppressed by this vaccination campaign, and so we, uh, the Germans in this case, the German non-Jews, are the new victims. And in, in some ways, that's a stark contrast to older anti-Semitic images that were about well, showing the Jew, depicting the Jew in a very harshly aggressive, negative way. Now, it's about the victim status. It's an acquisition of a being the Jew yourself, and, and then maybe also in other images, claiming that actually behind the conspiracy to get vaccinated is, of course, a Jewish conspiracy of Soros or uh, Bill Gates, who was believed to be Jewish in Germany for, long, for some time. Jason, if you can take us to the next two images. Sure. Uh, so here's a series of images uh, that uh, depict uh, the influence of Nazism directly and, uh, and indirectly on the region. Uh, in the top left corner uh, is the Farhud of 1941, which was a Nazi instigated pogrom. They had done a series, they had targeted Iraq, uh, which was under British uh, protection at the time, uh, and had partnered with the Islamists, you know, doing radio broadcasts, translating Mein Kampf into Arabic and distributing it. Uh, and the result was a, a pogrom on the Baghdadi Jews that may have cost more lives than in Kristallnacht. Um, and then the references to today, and you know, comparisons to Nazis or the Holocaust are as frequent as they are frequently wrong. Uh, but when you have, uh, as the case of Yemen, uh, Zig Heiling Houthis who are burning African refugees alive, uh, and in attacking, imprisoning, expelling Jews, or you have, uh, in the case of Doha and Qatar, at their book fair, the ever-present uh, translation of Mein Kampf, or again in the Houthis, the uh, top right corner, uh, their slogan of death to America, death to Israel, curse the Jews. Uh, as a, a member of our advisory board, Professor Norman Stillman, uh, noted one time a, a Houthi spokesman was asked about that, and he said, uh, well, we said curse the Jews. We didn't say kill the Jews. Uh, but when asked to clarify and when pointed out that, uh, in fact, the Houthis do say much more than that in their, in their writings. Um, and then in the lower corner in Pakistan, uh, God bless Hitler, which uh, we also have in the archive of uh, uh, pictures from uh, Europe of, at the time of people uh, having such a banner. But I want to end on a, a somewhat more optimistic note, uh, which is that in the, at the Center for Jewish History, uh, on Yom HaShoah in 2019, uh, Sheikh Dr. Muhammad Alisa, the Secretary General of the Muslim World League, uh, came here and signed an agreement with the Conference of Presidents of Major American Jewish Organizations uh, and the American Sephardi Federation to combat hate, bigotry, and fanaticism. And the agreement uh, explicitly talks about the lessons of the Holocaust and the lessons of anti-Semitism, specifically to, against Jews, as well as uh, how hatred against Jews inevitably leads to not only the, the murder of Jews, but also the destruction of any, any group that has adopted uh, this hatred. And in response to that, uh, and subsequently the sheikhs uh, bringing a delegation of Islamic scholars to Auschwitz and many other uh, positive activities, uh, he has been the subject of some of these uh, Jewish tropes. So of course you have uh, the image of the, the Jew controlling him or he's uh, responsible for atrocities. Um, uh, the other images there are, are of campaigns uh, against uh, myself and, and my wife, uh, who's a human rights lawyer and, uh, and journalist, uh, Irina Zuckerman, who's interviewed the Sheikh um, in, the, in the Arab News, uh, the, the Saudi's uh, premier English language uh, newspaper. Uh, and in response to that, there are hundreds of thousands of comments and all kinds of conspiracy theories associated with this, but thankfully, uh, the response to the, Europe, the import of European anti-Semitism is the work of someone like the Sheikh, who's going back to, the, to Islam uh, and true Islam uh, and reviving uh, the philo-Semitism uh, that, that has existed from the beginning. Before we get to our final two examples, I believe um, there's somebody who can collect uh, question cards. That's Ben over there uh, on the right side. So if you have questions you'd like to send to the far end of the aisle, he can collect those and bring them up, and then we'll be in a position for Q&A um, in a couple minutes. Uh, Jonathan, another unusual example. 
Yes, this is particularly unusual uh, because it, uh, when you look at it, there's nothing anti-Semitic whatsoever about this. This is a symbolic commemoration of the footbridge over the Chodna Street uh, in Warsaw. <laughs> And this uh, footbridge was a wooden footbridge over which Jews walked from the large section of the Warsaw Ghetto to the small section of the Warsaw Ghetto. And uh, the, the Polish scholar uh, Elzbieta Janicka has uh, analyzed this uh, structure in great detail. And she points out a couple of things, that it was a bridge which divided because underneath, between the large ghetto and the small ghetto, was the Aryan street. And so this bridge, which is supposedly something that unifies, was actually a vehicle for dividing Jews from Aryans in Warsaw in uh, 1939, 40, 41, 42, and so forth. The commemoration of this, with this really rather high-tech uh, and ornamental design purifies that location, empties it of all of its historical value, and turns it into a tourist attraction. So here we often speak of the Showa business as a business conducted in Hollywood uh, and the making of films, but in Poland, it is being used as a kind of way of causing people to normalize that history. And by normalizing that history, essentially uh, deprive it of its meaning, its depth, and its value, and therefore is in the service of Holocaust denial, which is a pervasive element in contemporary Polish politics, in, in, in uh, much uh, Polish institutional life, and in Polish media today. So perhaps the most profound image that we're going to look at tonight is the final one. Verla will explain it. Yeah, well, um, so coming to this point, as you can see, I um, have not chosen to show an image. I have chosen to leave this blank or rather black because unfortunately anti-Semitism has not disappeared in Europe and elsewhere in the world. It takes many different forms and tragically still is leading to attacks and to murder. No country seems to be immune or spared. And as a principle, it's very important important that we tackle the issue from the bottom of the pyramid of hate. And that actually means that we have to tackle stereotypes, stereotypes to which no one is immune to. It is not only up to us to, to tackle stereotypes in others, all of us have stereotypes in our own heads. And so these are ingrained ideas, and some ideas have been there for so long that we no longer question them or that we may not even be aware of them. And so what we see all often is that as a result of that, they can lead to bad things because the stereotypes are maybe not necessarily something that was there with bad intentions or that was anti-Jewish or anti-Semitic. For example, in media in Western Europe and especially also in Belgium, um, when there is a news article about uh, something related to the Jewish community, very, very often the illustration to the news item will be a Orthodox Hasidic Jew, uh, typically in the Diamond District of Antwerp. And that in itself creates and ingrains and strengthens these stereotypes that can then lead, when used in a bad way, to anti-Semitism. Stereotypes can lead to these prejudices. They can make us prejudge others. And that can be transmitted to our behavior. And then, if they are ingrained in these images, they can really have very, very dire consequences. Now, each individual has their own prejudices, but people belonging to the same group often have 
share similar prejudices about people of, an, of others outside of their group. And the more powerful group in society um, that can, uh, the most powerful uh, group in society can then have like stereotypes of less powerful minority groups in society. And this inequality is then transmitted in the behavior of individuals in the educational system, the ju judiciary, and by the government. And as a curator of a Holocaust memorial and museum, I'm all too, aware, too much aware of what this long-term ingrained ideas may be already in, considered acceptable um, stereotypes, this us-them thinking, what this can lead to. And this is why I find it appropriate to not choose one specific image at this point, but to call at this point for more awareness and action so that we are acting at the first steps in this spiral of hate, namely our behavior based on stereotypes, our acts based on stereotypes. And so whether that is reacting towards anti-Semitism, racism, or discrimination in any form, the more aware we are of our own biases and uh, open to acknowledging our own stereotypes and prejudices, the better. And then I would like to urge us all to kind of think back of the real images we showed at the beginning of this event and of what we know as Jewish life and Jewish in our world today. I was very, very reluctant to have an evening showing only these uh, horrible stereotypes, anti-Semitic stereotypes. And I'm convinced that this can only be done in a context in, in a context where you give the information to debunk them, to give the to kind of take them, analyze them and, and deconstruct them. And um, so that we do not create the opposite and give attention to something and make it spread even more. And so the mechanisms which we put to the fore in this fake images exhibition we have been able to use them to illustrate all the examples from the historical part of the exhibition, but equally all the examples that we are putting in the exhibition on discrimination, racism, and anti-Semitism today. So is it old wine and new barrels? The mechanisms have been at work, and they continue to be at work, and they can be deadly efficient. And so all I can ask for to conclude is to be extremely aware of our own biases and prejudice for what we've seen in this whole presentation and what we know the consequences can be. Thank you. Let me just uh, echo Verla's uh, comments by encouraging everybody to pay a visit to the United Nations to see the exhibition. And Jonathan, can you also just mention the exhibition that Evo has? Yes. So just so that people can sure. understand uh, that there is a, a, another exhibition at the United Nations that was uh, sponsored by the Evo Institute from our collection of materials on DP camps, uh, displaced persons camps at the end of World War II. It's called uh, After the End of the World. And uh, it contains a great deal of material about a very little known subject. There have been a couple of books about life in the DP camps, but not nearly enough. And uh, this exhibition, I believe, is the first really public exhibition on, on this subject. Marvelous. Um, so as scheduled, we have a um, very generous dessert reception that will start at 8.30. We do have some time for a Q&A, however. And of the questions that have already been um, passed forward to me, um, it, there's, there's, a, there's some common themes that I think are worth pointing to. Uh, one is the question, and I think I'm just going to allow all of our panelists to take a stab at these questions. Um, maybe we'll just go down. Maybe, Pam, if you start us off, and then we'll go this way. Um, the first question, and I'll read, I'll read three questions, and maybe we can just take whichever one appeals to us. Um, the first is sort of the broader question about whether European anti-Semitism today and American anti-Semitism today are more similar or different. So this is the question of similarities and differences between two parts of the Western world, um, but two parts of the world that have very different histories in terms of the Holocaust, to be sure. Um, a second question asks um, whether we 
and how we should address the question of anti-Zionism uh, as um, something that is very closely, but not necessarily, related to anti-Semitism, uh, and whether the anti-Zionist um, and anti-Israel sentiment we see in the country, um, how that can be distinguished from anti-Semitism and where the line might be. Uh, and then I suppose related to that is the question of anti-Semitism on the American and European left. Um, so if we talk about um, political anti-Semitism and the way it's weaponized, obviously we know from the history of uh, anti-Semitism, um, whether one looks at early Marx or, or uh, other uh, 19th century theorists, it was hardly a monopoly of the right. Um, and another question finally asked the question about um, college campuses today in the United States uh, and how um, severe the problem is uh, with regard to, let's say, the pressures that some uh, Jewish undergrads might feel, um, especially when it comes to issues pertaining to Israel. So um, I'm condensing uh, about 10 cards into three themes, but maybe whatever, uh, whichever of those topics you want, you want to tackle, Pam, if you can start us off. All right. Why don't I start us off by talking about the college campus, since I spent most of my life on a college campus in the United States. So what we have on, on the college campus is there's no question that we have rising anti-Semitism on the college campuses. I, I want to be very careful about how I frame this. So it, it comes, it, it's definitely obviously related to anti-Zionism and anti-Israel um, uh, thinking. And it, it's very loud and it comes from a very small segment of the community by and large. Where it doesn't come from a small segment of the community is when students are asked to check their pro-Israel support um, when they want to join some kind of um, a club, an environmental club, a women's rights club. And they're, they're basically, there's like a litmus test. Well, if you're Jewish and like over 80% of American Jews, you say, we know this from the 2020 Pew survey, you say that you support either strongly or you know or moderately you support the existence of the state of Israel then you don't really belong in this place because you don't stand with us on these other issues so these are very complicated issues that said and i think this is really important and i hope everyone hears it american jews send 90 95% of their 18 to 22 year olds or beyond 22 year olds I, i've got a kid who you know just finished medical school we send them to american universities they are by and large and we know this from the work of some of my colleagues like ari kelman at um, stanford by and large day to day they are perfectly fine but they do from time to time during their four years on campus encounter anti-Semitism. And I'm currently writing a book on the history of American anti-Semitism. And one of the things that I have learned as I've been researching this book is that those memories and the emotions they evoked, they will stay with these students as they have stayed for some of the people I've interviewed for the next half century or more. So I'm not minimizing it, but I'm saying that by and large, they're OK. Anti-Semitism, I don't think, is, is it's, it's not endangering them, but they won't always remember the roommate that decided to, you know, play some kind of video game and then put one of those memes in that video game. Thank you. Ufa, any other questions that you want to tackle? Yeah. I first want to say a few words about the comparative perspective of European and American anti-Semitism. I'm not a specialist on the United States, but I would say two things that I find important. One is historically, um, the most of the tropes that we know from European um, anti-Semitism has also has also been present in the U.S. In fact, we have just discussed uh, some of the images that we shared here today with you. Uh, I have some very similar uh, um, examples on the other side of the Atlantic. On the other hand, there, I'm sure there are some specialities and some differences. For example, in the contemporary world, you do not find the same kind of, how should I phrase this, uh, evangelical philo-Semitism that can actually be combined with religious anti-Semitism in Europe, at least not as much. Uh, there are powers who try to change this, but uh, uh, so we do see it in some 
in some cases, but it's not as prominent simply because the evangelical movement is not as strong in, the, in most European countries. Um, the other element that I wanted to, um, and the other element here I wanted to stress is that we are not talking about separate universe. If ever the universe is less, these universes are less separate. In, in an age where um, somebody can make a happy merchant image of his own and circulate this on an image board, this is not just in the US, even if that person sits, I don't know, in New Jersey or in um, Florida. It's out there and it's immediately on the other side of the globe um, within split seconds. And so if it may have been possible in the, in the past to differentiate, I don't think it is any longer that easy. Um, and in many ways we see developments that, we, that I read about in the US and and about a few weeks, uh, it used to be years, but now <laughs> I would say it's about a few weeks. For example, the Soros preoccupation was first Hungarian, then it came to the US, and now it's all over the place. And Germans learned it quite quickly throughout the pandemic uh, to replace basically Rothschild with Soros. The other thing that I wanted to say is about anti-Zionism. Um, Anti-Zionism is often discussed for very good reasons, and I, I understand and I, I can agree with data uh, on this, is often discussed on the one hand as a, as a problem about Muslim communities. In most of the European cases, uh, migrants from Arab countries or from Turk, Turk, uh, Turkish uh, settings, um, or it is discussed as left-wing. Both both cases, both phenomenon exist, and I don't want to belittle them, and it's a problem, and we heard examples today about the, the Islamic world. Um, yet, don't underestimate the amount of anti-Zionism among the bourgeois middle class. I can see this, and I can measure this in many European countries. If you ask people about Jews, they will be hesitant to admit that they have problems, but if you immediately ask them about Israelis or about Israel, the numbers go up, and not just a bit, they actually are usually twice as big. So 15 to 10, 10 to 15 percent of people who say, would agree to a statement that is negative about Jews, uh, you have that quite frequently in Germany, but you have 30 to 35 percent of people who agree um, uh, with uh, Israeli uh, with, if you replace the same sentence with the word Israeli. And we don't have 35% of Muslims, and even if you count the few left in there, um, uh, it's that, that is middle class to some degree. So I think we should not narrow our discussion. Uh, in, in, I cannot comment on this on the United States, but in Europe, I think anti-Zionism is a, is, a, is a way to legitimately talk in a negative way about Jews without doing so. Thank you. Jason? So it's, it's critically important to differentiate between anti-Semitism um, as it has manifested historically and, and anti-Zionism. The way to do this is, uh, people are just training to do this now, is uh, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition of uh, anti-Semitism, which is a working definition that's been adopted by the United States. and something like 30 countries around the world. Um, this grew out of, the rea of, of, uh, of, of a many examples uh, of you know, a synagogue being torched and the perpetrators being, uh, being uh, let off uh, because it was said to be anti-Israel activism. <coughs> what is the connection between bombing a synagogue and Israel? Uh, it's lost on most people. Uh, similarly, in New York, one of our uh, young scholars uh, was on the NYU campus uh, when she was told that she, as a Syrian Sephardic Jew, coming from an Arabic-speaking background, couldn't take an Arabic class because the other students didn't feel comfortable. They, they didn't feel comfortable because uh, she had supposedly used her Zionist black magic, this is what the professor told her, uh, to have two students expelled. Those two students had physically assaulted and committed arson against a pro-Israel demonstration on campus. 
Uh, so she had very, very strong magic to be able to get arsonists and, and uh, uh, violent uh, assaulters arrested. Um, so th this, this idea has, has, to, uh, has to be put to rest uh, of uh, anti Zion, you know, playing this game. And, and you see in the example of Kanye, you know, he was slipping up in some of these interviews, one minute saying the, the Jews, or I won't talk about who it is, and then he inevitably goes to say who it is, and then talking about Zionists. Um, and this goes back to the UN resolution of Zionism against racism. Uh, Zionism is racism that the Soviet Union uh, perpetrated, as, as well as the, the protests that I showed of uh, the May Day Parade in 1972. Uh, another thing to keep in mind is that Zionism in the Middle East uh, means the all the conspiracy theories, uh, means the protocols, uh, means, means Rothschild, uh, means all of these things. It, people have no idea what Zionism actually stands for it, it, Jewish people having a right to self-determination. Um, so when U.S. policy was being applied that Zionism is uh, anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism, um, it was not necessarily helpful in these kinds of discussions with Middle Eastern Muslims who do want to stand up against anti-Semitism, uh, but want to do so within their historical context. Um, so I think this is uh, something that we should work on uh, getting greater adoption of the IRA uh, definition of anti-Semitism uh, and applying it rigorously and uh, on campus situation response to, to that incident and other incidents we've created a fellowship uh, and are working with students across the country uh, who are kind of shell-shocked uh, from what's happening both uh, within the Jewish community and without uh, and are looking for, for guidance. Uh, and needless to say you know, the origins of BDS, uh, the Boycott, Divestment and Sanction campaign and all of these things have their roots in <coughs> Nazi Germany and, and the Soviet Union. I, I think that when we look at uh, anti-Zionism, uh, we should look at who is the greatest ally of uh, Israel. And when we look at that, and it's obviously the United States of America, what we see, I think, is that a lot of anti-Zionism is conflated with anti-Americanism. And this anti-American bias is one that is uh, fueled to a great extent by the left in the United States and in England. It's the left that, uh, if you have not read uh, What is to be Done by Lenin, I suggest that you read it. Uh, it is a left that is uh, fueled by a history of hatred, frankly, against uh, uh, what is thought to be corporate capitalism. And uh, it is easier, of course, to hate uh, the United States of America through Israel than necessarily as a Brit or an American to come out against the United States as such, because then the ultimate uh, root cause is exposed and is uh, made more vulnerable uh, for discussion. But when it is focused on Israel and Zionism, and uh, as uh, Jason very rightly points out, this, this equation of Zionism and anti-Semitism, where does it come from? It comes from the Soviet Union. It comes from the anti-American propaganda that was developed carefully by the KGB over a long period of time in the service of an ideology that is rooted in one basic idea that was articulated very clearly by Stalin at the end of World War II. The world is divided into two camps, the capitalist camp and the socialist camp. And they are uh, uh, at war with each other. Stalin absolutely believed that. He may not have believed much else, but he absolutely believed that. And that is a form of the propaganda that gets pumped into the Middle East and unfortunately into our American universities. Barilla, it's to your credit that we're here this evening. This is a marvelous exhibition. How about some concluding remarks? Yeah, well, uh... 
I'm not going to uh, be too lengthy, but what I, what I would say about the European and American anti-Semitism is that what, what there are definitely a lot of similarities, but what you also discern is different sensitivities based on our own histories and based on the histories of crimes against humanity in the respective places, be it um, uh, in Europe or in the US. And that creates that in certain cases, what is something that will be reacted to very quickly if it would occur in the US, sometimes gets less of a reaction or not sufficient reaction in Europe and probably vice versa. Um, and what I also notice is that there's still um, a lot of um, uncertainty or n not understanding of the gravity of anti-Semitism, current anti current day anti-Semitism in Europe. If we are, for example, dealing with uh, signaling to a high school in Belgium since the beginning of the school year that if the kids of a certain class call their WhatsApp group, where are the Jews, um, that that might not be a great idea and that they should reflect on stereotypes and that so many months later they still have not grappled on how to deal with that. That is something that is usually concerning to me. If, if, if we then go to where anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism come together, um, I think that is some of the, the, the trickiest problems and um, I think we should be uh, trying to call it out when we see it. It is not okay if Hanukkah wishes outed somewhere are returned by a wish to end apartheid, referring to the Middle East. It is not okay if what happens in the Middle East leads to actions at a place like a memorial site, and that refers to what happened during the Holocaust, whose innocent victims have nothing to do with what happens in the, in the Middle East, regardless of what one's view is on that. So um, in light of being at the eve of International <coughs> Holocaust Remembrance, they, that is what shocks me the most profoundly. So um, I wish I could end on a more positive note, but unfortunately I, I just, just do hope that we have people, more and more people standing up to respect at least um, the, the, mem the memory of the so many victims. Please join me in thanking our panelists. And please avail yourselves of the dessert reception, which will go on for uh, about a half an hour. Thank you.